My name's Elijah, and I work at Two Sigma. Um, I've been running a team called Quantitative Reliability for the last few years, and I'm here to talk about how we build trust in our data science pipelines. Uh, memorize this, it's very important. So, Two Sigma, uh, we're a quantitative investment manager that invests hundreds of thousands of data sets and dives into them for predictive power. Uh, at the center of all of this is machine learning and statistical analysis. Uh, and that's kind of what I'll be focusing on. The sort of the pipelines and how uh, that's structured together. So, on the agenda today, I'll be answering a few questions. First, why do we care about pipelines? What's important and how are they structured? Next, what can go wrong in a pipeline? So what are some edge cases and where can pipelines act strange? How do we improve them? So some best practices that we've learned and things we're implementing. And what have we learned? What have we learned from this experience and what kind of can you take home? The world is full of data. Uh, you've got data lakes, that is really fast, data reservoirs, like all sorts of uh, water-based data metaphors, and, uh, and it's, it's pervasive in what we do. It's uh, the basis of a lot of what we do for a living. And data in itself, however, is not particularly useful. Unless you're a data scientist or really good at crunching the numbers, you can't get much from raw data. So in the industry, we turn it into information by using a pipeline. So I'm going to talk a little bit I'm going to define some terms before we move on. All right, so data is just raw facts collected for reference or analysis. So let's say you're deciding on a city to move to, and you really care about the weather. Some data that might be relevant would be the highs and lows uh, temperature every day for the last 10 years. That gives you what you need to know, but you have to do a lot on it before you actually get it. So you may want to actually think about what information is relevant to you. Information is data organized or presented to be useful. So now that you have this data, what you might actually want to know is how the temperature varies on a monthly basis. So to turn that data, the daily highs and lows, into information, you can aggregate it by month and take the averages. That way you might know that your, the city you really like is actually way too hot in July and way too cold in February. And we do this a lot, uh, a lot of this ad hoc analysis, a lot of this turning data into information, so we automate it. And that's called a pipeline, which is a software system that turns data into information. That's where I'll be focusing on this talk. Before I talk about actual data science pipelines, I want to tell a story about another industry, something that represents sort of the challenges and the concepts fairly well, and it's kind of interesting. So let's talk about camera lenses for a second. Lenses take light, which is much like data. Uh, light is raw, it's out there, it has everything you need to know, but it's not particularly organized, and turns it into an image, which is much like information. Uh, it's distilled and usable by the human eye. Lenses have been around for quite a while. One of the more, the first modern lenses was created in 1817, discovered in 1817 by Carl Friedrich Gauss. It's called the Gauss Objective Lens and consists of two closely spaced menisci. They're uh, just pieces of glass, a negative one and a positive one, referring to the concavity or convexity. And this was a design of a nearly perfect lens, so it had very few aberrations. But again, it was nearly perfect. And, we can, and people continue to improve upon it. So this is where it started. This is a nice, simple, elegant system. Very easy to work with, very easy to understand. But it got more complicated over time. So in 1888, uh, Alvin Clark and Bosch and Long refined the design by placing two of these together. Turns out it's better, has a different aperture. Great. Uh, we've got a new version, seven years later, that is a more optimal system. 
In 1896, they added two thick interior menisci. Again, a different aperture, uh, corrected for chromatic aberrations, and shipped this one. And the one most resembling modern lenses, kind of the sort of the start of what we see in cameras to this day, was created by Taylor, Taylor, and Hobson in 1920. Uh, the cool thing about this is it's asymmetric, so it's kind of an interesting design and ends up creating a better lens with fewer aberrations. And the system that started off so simple got more complicated. So what started off as these two pieces of glass ended up in hundreds of different designs over the years, uh, forming the basis of a lot of modern lenses we have in cameras by this day, created by a bunch of different companies. So we've witnessed a system that's gone from very simple to complex. And there's nothing inherently bad about a complex system, but there are challenges you have to navigate. So in a complex system, if a piece is broken, so let's say in a complex system, you've gotten it to work perfectly. You've managed to put all the pieces of glass together such that you get the optimal image. If a piece is broken, or for instance, the manufacturer that creates that material is no longer around to give you the next variant, it might not work exactly as intended. The image might not look correct. It takes a lot of work to get it working again and to make sure that it's robust to these changes. So the system has gone from simple to complex, and furthermore, it's difficult to verify. It's hard to know that your lens is producing the correct image. It's subjective and it's fairly interesting. They have all sorts of strategies in the camera industry for doing this. I'm not going to go into them now, but if you have questions, I've done some research. But I want to bring this back to data science pipelines and sort of see, use this model to talk about where Two Sigma was and some of the problems that we've faced. So recall, we're taking a pipeline and replacing a piece. In 2015, we had a fairly complicated pipeline. We run large collections of back tests for training simulations. Uh, this is where we spend the majority of our compute, and most of it, the platform, is written in Java. So back at the time, I think in 2001, uh, using Java was fairly bold, and we've seen it through a bunch of different iterations. By this time, we ended up at Java 7. And it came time to upgrade. Java 8 has all sorts of great features. We've got uh, Lambda functions and default functions in the interface. So we wanted to replace Java 7, which was pervasive throughout our system, with Java 8. This was not as easy as you might think. Like, obviously, what can go wrong with a routine upgrade? Well, it turns out a lot of things went wrong. And I want to talk about one of the more sort of funky problems we saw. The problem that we observed was non-determinism. So non-determinism occurs when you take a program, run it, record the results, take that program, run it again, and record the results with the exact same inputs, and the results end up being different for no perceived reason. And you keep doing that and get different results. Uh, that's crazy. That is not how you'd think these systems should work especially if you didn't intend it to be that way. And it caused a lot of headaches for us. It caused us to have reduced confidence in our processes, results that weren't reproducible. We couldn't share among the company because they couldn't actually be recreated. And our trading simulations behaved erratically. Worst of all, given that we had so many different result sets, we didn't even know what the right result was. So we started debugging it. Debugging this was not easy. Uh, we had to contend with a lot of different things that made it hard. So we had to work with black boxes, uh, pieces of the system that you can't really see inside, that you don't have a lot of knowledge about, pieces that were guarded due to IP sensi intellectual property sensitivity, or certain people were experts in and not everybody knew about, that we couldn't just dive into. Complex monoliths large systems that shared state, that you can't just start from a certain point or replay from scratch. 
you had to build the state up over time, and that made it hard to work with, hard to dive in, isolate the problem, and debug. And finally, no single team was responsible for this whole thing. Everybody was doing their job well. They were all looking at their component and ensuring that that piece got the right results. But nobody was looking at the whole picture, at how Java interacted with the system. So we kept debugging, uh, worked our way through this, and after a lot of headaches, we ruled out a few things that usually cause non-determinism. So a standard topic is race conditions, and we found some race conditions in certain places, but we realized that that wasn't actually causing this. Uh, we didn't use random number generators, and if we did, we seeded them, which is a pretty standard strategy to make something appear random, but actually be deterministic. And it was not gamma rays. Uh, we didn't experience this more when we had solar flares. I'm going to explain what, was hap what happened after a while, uh, after a lot of debugging. So to understand the explanation, there are two topics that I want to kind of dive into. One is floating point numbers and why they're weird. And the other is the Java collection spec. Floating point numbers. There was a great quote I read recently. Somebody said, a leaky abstraction is a black box that you have to open up on occasion, open up occasionally. And I think that's a great description for why floating point numbers function so strangely. So floating point numbers are an abstraction over real numbers. But, and you'd expect them as they're an abstraction to behave all, to observe all the same properties. But it turns out that they actually don't. There are certain cases in which properties, such as associativity, which I'll show you in a second, don't behave as you'd think. So this is an example from Python. Uh, it's fairly simple, but it shows how reversing the order of addition doesn't do exactly what you might think. Now, we're adding these three numbers in reverse order in the first case and getting exactly what you'd expect and in ascending order in the second case, and getting something just slightly off. That difference is called an ULP, a ULP, that means the smallest difference between two floating point numbers. And while it's not huge, it's enough to raise hairs. It's enough to say something's off. Let's look at the Java collection spec, the other piece of the puzzle. So, a collection, you may know in Java, holds a bunch of different objects. And the collection that we're going to be talking about here is a map, which holds associations from keys to values, specifically a hash map. You can do a lot of things with a hash map, and one of the more common operations is to iterate through it, to run through all the numbers from the beginning to the end and get them all in an iterator. So some of you probably see where this is going, but if you don't, don't feel bad, because this took us a long time to figure out. Between, in all versions of Java, uh, the iteration order has never been specified in the contract. So reading the Java doc, you can see that some map implementations, like the tree map class, make specific guarantees as to their order. Others, like the hash map class, our culprit here, do not. Between Java 1 and Java 7, this iteration order happened to be deterministic. You could say iterate, you could iterate through a hash map and do that exact same again, and you were guaranteed, not by contract, but by implementation, to get the right result, or to get the same result. In Java 8, something funny happened. This iteration order became non-deterministic. So the reason for this is interesting, and there's a lot of history behind it, but in essence, they decided to use a tree to resolve collisions instead of a linked list, in certain cases. So when there are more than eight collisions, which rarely happens, they would use a tree to handle all of that. This is specifically like an attack mode, where you think your hash map is getting overcrowded. And that would be all good and fine. A tree should be deterministic in iteration order as well, unless you're not actually good at breaking ties, and your objects don't implement comparable fairly well. So, in that case, in which there was no good comparable to work off of, uh, 
they use the system.identity hash code. The system.identity hash code uses the location and memory, as known by Java, to spit out an identity for or a hash value for an object. And that in itself, there's no guarantee from run to run, because it just depends on how Java organizes its memory. So these trees ended up having an iteration order that could occasionally depend on the system.identity hash code. As, the, as iterating through the whole hash map iterated through the trees as well, that ended up being non-deterministic in order. So to put this together, we've got hash maps that store key value data. And we perform aggregations over those values. So that require associativity. And the iteration order actually changes the aggregation results due to how floating point numbers are weird. So the impact on our system was all over the place. You've got hash map data that's keyed on stock IDs. So remember, we're making predictions on instruments, on stocks here. Algorithms use this data to make predictions. Uh, they run normalizations. They calculate moments. They assign, assign quantiles and run regressions. These are all like the bits and pieces that make up your machine learning algorithm. And the, when you string these together, these little bits, these OLPs, end up magnifying. So especially when you put them together with a whole pipeline, that ends up having a very big impact. And as a financial company, we really care about that impact. And our models were producing non-deterministic output. The solution here isn't particularly profound, but you want to be able to use mapping structures, if you're doing aggregations, that guarantee the order, such as linked hash map and tree map. And you don't want to rely on the implementation details. It's worth reading the contract, reading the fine print, to figure out exactly what will happen. But these won't actually solve every problem. We saw another non-determinism issue that was really weird, and this is kind of a fun one to talk about. So we saw more non-determinism when we upgraded Java 8, specifically a minor Java 8 upgrade from one version to another. And oh, sorry, this is a minor Java 8 upgrade. And after some digging around, we realized that the culprit was a function math.pow. Math.pow raises a number x to another number y, and it was producing results that were non-deterministic. This is not supposed to happen. It's actually very unclear whether it's in the contract or not, but it's kind of the contract that people assume when they sit down to write programs. So after creating a reproduction and banging our head against a wall, we did what all reasonable engineers would do, which is open up a ticket to the Java, to the people who'd written this, saying, this thing is broken. And the result we got was interesting. It turns out that math.pow, where specifically where the number, uh, the exponent was 2, contained an optimization bug. So to understand this, an optimization bug meaning a compiler optimization bug. So to understand why this occurs, you have to know what the just-in-time compiler is, which is a tool that compiles code as your program is being executed. It's run in a lot of, it's used heavily throughout Java, and it can do some really cool things. So it can kind of do adaptive learning on the branches in your program to figure out like, which one is faster and where it wants to go. And in this case, it was making a choice between two different paths, x times x and x squared. Now, again, you, these are the same, right? Like, mathematically, these are equivalent expressions. But for floating point numbers, these actually aren't. The implementations of these functions in math utilizes different pieces, uh, different machine code, actually. So it would non-deterministically, due to a bunch of different heuristics, choose between these two values. And they would get different results, leading to different results in our code. So, the explanation is here. You can see the machine code instructions. I think these are two different systems. 
But in one case, it was using fmol, a pretty standard multiplier, and the other case, it was using molSD or vmolSD, which I think are more precise uh, multipliers for certain types of floating points. So these problems kind of plagued us. We were curious where to go from here. We realized we couldn't just keep playing whack-a-mole. We needed to be a little more proactive about it. We needed eyes over our pipeline. And we needed somebody who could see the forest for the trees. So we created a team, and we called it quantitative reliability. That's where I come in. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk telling you first about how we think about these types of problems and what our role is, and then next about some of the specific problems we've faced and how we've approached them. So the goal of this team is to evaluate quality of quantitative results. Recall that like camera lenses, they're nuanced and are hard to judge, so this is quite a piece of work. So starting off, I'd always thought of software systems as kind of being working or not working, being a binary. So they were up or they were down, they, your uh, metric was green or red, your system was working or online or offline, and your tests were passing or failing. This fr kind of framework and way of thinking had always appealed to me, but it turns out, as we started, there's kind of more of a spectrum here. So your quantitative results can, aim, can start off as utter garbage. Uh, it can be, on one hand, utter garbage, garbage in, garbage out. On the other hand, very high quality, handling edge cases and uh, b building a nice cohesive picture of the world. So at, at, the first, at the start, we started trying to make this more perfect, uh, getting each result to be cleaner. But that was only one piece of the picture, one piece of the puzzle. It turns out that we actually had, there was a cost to making every result better. So not only did we have to consider result quality, but we also had to think about a trade-off in some sort of cost. So this cost could be in any number of things. There's the time we save. So by the way, this axis is kind of funny. The uh, high cost is at the bottom. You can think of this as inexpensiveness. And the low cost is at the top there. So bear that in mind. You think about the time we've saved, uh, the actual cost of data we get, of code we write, of systems we use, the compute resources we use. Sometimes you can, for instance, if you run a machine learning program for more iterations, you can actually get a better result, but it's not always clear that it's worth it. And the operational burden. So it takes a lot of people, a lot of hard work to make results good. So to understand how we make this trade-off, I'm going to borrow a concept from finance. We are a finance company, after all, called the Efficient Frontier. This is a concept that's used in portfolio optimization. So portfolio optimization is a science where you decide how to construct a portfolio. You have a set of stocks, and you want to figure out what's the optimal portfolio of these stocks. To do so, you have a few things to consider. One is the expected returns from these stocks, and the other is the risk associated with it. So expected returns is how well you think it'll do, how much money do you think you'll make from that stock. And the risk is, what's the variance on that? What are the error bars? It turns out there's actually an inherent trade-off between these two. And there's no one best portfolio solution. There are a lot of them. In fact, they fit along a curve that looks kind of like this. To bring this back to, uh, to looking at our result quality, when you think about the re result quality kind of as the returns, how well do you want to do, and these costs as the risk. So let's look at a few points on this. If you're on the upper left of this, you can have inexpensive, low-quality results. So you run some sort of cheap algorithm that approximates it, but it doesn't take a lot of work and doesn't do very well. Or you can have expensive, high-quality results. These are both good places to be. You're on the curve. You're doing as well as possible. However, where you don't want to be is here, you don't want to have suboptimal results. You don't want to be within this curve because that means that for the same result quality you're getting, you could spend less time, you could uh, spend less money, or for the same cost, you could get a better result. So the goal of this team is to push things out to the frontier and 
make sure we're functioning optimally. So when we approach these problems, we've got a few different hats uh, to wear. We're a team of many hats. And these are really just sort of way, scopes at which we think about these problems. Uh, looking at the actual data, sort of functioning as a data scientist, we've got the data detective. This is people, like, the way of thinking that's solving that non-determinism problem, really digging in and really figuring out uh, what the actual issue is. So taking us from behaving within the curve to on the frontier of the curve. The engineer builds out frameworks, uh, addresses those issues on a more systemic level, and makes sure that we're continually behaving optimally. So the engineer might be building out frameworks to test for determinism or pushing forward with a Java upgrade. And at the highest scope, there's the architect designing the system, figuring out what that curve looks like and how we should actually be functioning. Not just where we are, but where we could be. Using this framework, I'm going to be talking a bit about some of the problems we've seen with a, through a specific example. And this example is that of aggregate polling models, which I find very interesting and fairly relevant to this day. So an aggregate polling model, the goal is to predict election results based off of polls. So a poll is where you where a company that often specializes in this calls up people and asks them their opinion. It could be they could call them, they could email them, there could be a survey sent out. And specifically about uh, political elections. So from the one you probably know that does the team you probably know that does the best job of this is called 538. They I think were associated with the New York Times back in the day, but Nate Silver, a fairly well-known data scientist, run this. And this is their most recent forecast, or one of their more recent forecasts, for the congressional elections in 2018. Uh, this is a really complicated system, and there's all sorts of great blogs about how they create this, but the things to note are that it outputs something fairly complicated, a probability distribution. So it doesn't just say this will happen, but it says here are a range of results as to what may happen. And I'm not going to go into detail as to how theirs works, but let's look at a simplified version of how one might construct an aggregate polling model. So you've got the data coming in, your historical polling data, that is the result of polls going back in time. From this, you construct weighted averages. You want to get a probability for each one of these congressional districts, so you use each historical polling data, each historical polling datum, to get that average. Then, as you cannot really come up with a closed form probability distribution for this, you run a Monte Carlo simulation, which is just sample from a probability distribution and see what happens. And finally, the Monte Carlo simulation outputs a probability distribution. Remember that Monte Carlo simulations use some amount of randomness in this, uh, so you get a fairly interesting output. So, a problem that you might observe that we've seen is that of stateful models. So the assumption here, and you may not agree with this, but again, it's a trade-off, is that models should behave like perfect functions. From the same exact input, they should get the same exact output. And so this often occurs in time series models where you prime them, you run them for certain amounts of time, and the results may differ based off of the start time of it. So you want to know the forecast the day before the election, because that's the most important. But if you run that model, warm it up on six months of data, versus running it on 12 months of data, you could actually get different results. Now again, this is a trade-off. Uh, you may really care about this. This may be very important to your system, or it might not be. For us, it is. So I'm going to talk about how this might occur and some best practices. This happens when models carry internal state. So by internal state, in this case, here's what I mean. Remember this part of the pipeline. Your machine learning models take in historical polling data, and they construct weighted averages. The weighted averages are built using two sort of 
pieces of information. One is some sort of subjective weighting on the quality of that poll. Some pollsters are more reliable than others. And the other is the recency. So if, you've know, if you know the term exponential moving average, that's a common implementation of some sort of weighting based off of recency. And what's happening is that your model is remembering the data that it's seen. So it's running through this, collecting each poll and adding that to its internal, internal state, the average. This causes it to be stateful because it really just has more data when it's running for 12 months than six months. Now, the solution to this is kind of to slightly adjust how we think about it uh, and write stateless models. By stateless models, I don't mean that it can't take in a lot of data. Your model should absolute, can absolutely be taking in a lot of data. But you want it to be taking in all this data as input and not as a side effect. So if instead of taking in just that day's data, each day you run it, your model takes in a history of data, perhaps a fixed history of the last six months, or an infinite history, then every day it'll have all the previous data that it needs and it can, conduct, it can construct a weighted average. This is the first approach, kind of what the data detective might take, uh, making sure that we function more optimally and have systems that are uh, more, less stateful. And the higher scoped approach is actually build a framework to test for state. So when you release a new weighting system, a new model, you can actually test it to make sure that it gets the same results for six months and 12 months beforehand. Let's talk about the problem of validating your pipeline. So the symptom here is kind of vague. Pipelines produce unexpected results. For instance, as an example, the election results are skewed towards one outcome. You expect to see distributions like this, uh, nice and normal, like all data is normal. Uh, but instead, you're seeing something funky like this where it's all focused on one specific piece. The explanation of these types of issues can kind of be anywhere. In the data you see, in the code you've written to do this, in the framework that you use and rely upon, or the infrastructure that you use to get the data into your code. Uh, but the thing I'm kind of referring to is when you use a hard-coded random seed in your Monte Carlo sim. So you probably... So Let's say this model took the lesson about non-determinism to heart and wanted to make systems super reproducible. You have to have the right set of random seeds so the Monte Carlo simulation gets reasonable results. So again, this is a sort of smaller scoped answer that solves this specific problem. But in general, we want to think about, again, about our systems as a function. So it's good to define a contract and validate it regularly. So a contract in this case might be that the results of your pipeline are normally distributed with a certain standard, range of standard deviations and a range of means. And you could run that regularly to make sure that your system's working. Every time you release new data, you ensure that it's still getting standardly normal distribu standard normal distributions outputted. This takes a lot of work, and again, it's a trade-off. It's not always worth it. But and it requires a lot of knowledge about how your system works. But we found this to be very valuable, and it's helped us catch a lot of interesting bugs. So the last problem I want to talk about is input data sensitivity. So the symptom is that your models are susceptible to slight changes in input. Let's take an example. Uh, if you add a new set of similar polls, so let's say you have one set of polls from one pollster, and you have another pollster that kind of tracks that pollster fairly closely. So you add in their polls as well, figuring more data, the better. But you don't expect the results to change that much. And it turns out on occasion that results you don't expect to change do. The explanation here is often due to unstable numeric algorithms. So algorithms that really react to this. There are a lot of these. Uh, K-means clustering ends up being very sensitive to outliers. When you have algorithms that divide by z-score, you can suffer from actual floating point things that have huge sort of cascading effects. But the best practices here are to actually run sensitivity tests by perturbing your input data. So this is a pretty standard strategy, and we've gotten some mileage out of it. Uh, but you could add little fuzz to your polls to make sure the results don't actually change that much. Add that to your contract that we defined, 
and run it regularly to make sure your system stays stable. And shuffle your input data to test your model's robustness. So ensure that, so this is a very common strategy in machine learning, but to make sure you're not overfitting to the order you see, you can change around the input data. It's a very easy thing to do, and it works in non-time series models, models very well, because the order really tends to not matter. And if your results are crazy, and are very different based on the shuffling, then you probably have some sort of instability in the system. So to get started with quantitative reliability, first, it's worth labeling problems as quantitative reliability. Think about, you've probably seen a lot of things like this, uh, and it's worth thinking about them as problems that aren't just simple, that you can't just fix like a bug, but that have sort of more complicated solutions and are part of trade-offs and nuanced results. Then start off small, dedicate a quantitative reliability engineer who can sort of look at the bigger picture and, uh, and you can look at the bigger picture and see the forest for the trees. You can really like focus in on the details, function as the data detective, but also start building out frameworks and thinking about the whole system and work with people across the company. Then expand in scope. So, You'll start off doing work as a data detective, figuring out a bunch of issues and getting sort of a track record up. Then you'll start building systems to address those issues and classes of issues. And then you'll start designing the next system so that you don't see those issues in the future. And all, there are a lot of other problems that I haven't hit on that I think would be valuable to look at in this space, or that would, I would think would fall under the umbrella of quantitative reliability. So for instance, understanding your machine learning pipelines. There was a great talk last year about diving into the black box, and that's a hot topic. Uh, and I think that falls under quantitative reliability as the trade-off between the result quality and sort of how you understand it, and the actual cost of digging in and trying to understand it versus producing new models. There's selecting hardware, which can have really interesting impacts on quantitative results. Testing your machine learning algorithms, figuring out how to validate them so they do well. Uh, there's a talk right after this one in, I think, the next building, in which they propose a framework to do just that. Ensuring reproducible research. Again, it's a trade-off between the work you put in and the results you get and how usable they are in the future. And just validating your data. We get data in from everywhere and making sure that it's sane is quite a bit of work that can really impact your result quality. So back to the questions that I asked at the beginning. Why do we care about pipelines? Well, pipelines turn data into usable information. Most companies have some sort of data pipelines that impact how they function and help them make business decisions. What can go wrong in a pipeline? Well, everything can go wrong in a pipeline. Uh, pipelines grow in complexity and have a lot of moving pieces. I outlined a bunch of possible issues, and there are a lot more. How do we improve them? Well, here are some best practices. Uh, writing stateless systems, defining and validating your contracts, run input sensitivity tests, and just validate your models as a function. So you can test attributes such as state, statelessness, determinism, and quantitative robustness. And finally, what have we learned? Well, pipelines are too complex to manage themselves. Think about quantitative reliability and consider actually making a team or really focusing in on these. Thank you so much, uh, and have a lovely evening. I'm happy to answer questions uh, or just like hang around after the talk.